Hi, I'm Dan and welcome to Polar Currency in video number 7. Polar Currency is about finding the stories and history that paper currency represents. This video provides a general overview of pre-Civil War paper currency commonly referred to today as obsolete banknotes. But you know I'm going to go deeper. Along the way we'll look at some curiously beautiful banknotes and of course there's going to be a few stories. But before we begin, we have to rewind the clock four score and seven years, one year before the 13 colonies united together and declared independence in 1776. According to my currency books, non-federal pre-Civil War U.S. currency is basically divided into two groups, colonial banknotes leading up to roughly 1810 and obsolete currency issued between the War of 1812 and the U.S. Civil War. Sure, there are subcategories such as Confederate notes in the Republic of Texas, but those locations weren't part of the United States of America. Since the colonization of what is now the United States, there has always been a shortage of coin or hard money. The second that Europeans set foot in British America, there wasn't enough gold and silver currency, and that would continue through to the 1870s. So when there was a shortage of coin, which was basically all the time, paper currency stepped in and served a purpose. In the pre-industrial revolution era from 1800 to 1850, with the population and the economy growing at a rapid rate, the lack of circulating currency became acute. There were never enough precious metals to meet demand, and capacity always seemed to be limited even when the U.S. Mint added three branches in 1838 two of which only minted gold coins. Good, bad, or ugly. Paper currency served a need, an ever-growing need that coinage simply could not meet. According to the Harvard Library, the first of what could be considered federal issuance of paper currency was approved by the Second Continental Congress in 1775 as a way of funding the Revolutionary War. Although this wasn't the first issue of paper notes in the colonies, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had issued its own banknotes in 1690. Over the course of the Revolutionary War, more currency was needed and combined with additional issues of bills of credit this led to widespread inflation. Basically, the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Remember, there was no Department of the Treasury and the U.S. Mint wouldn't begin operations until 1792. By the war's conclusion in 1781, the exchange value of the continental dollar would eventually fall 1,000%. This gave rise to the phrase, not worth a continental, which provides a little foreshadowing. The front of my 1775 Continental Note has the top and borders stating the United Colonies with Continental Currency printed on the left and right. The center contains the redemption statement entitling the bearer of two Spanish mill dollars or the value of gold or silver. The right center depicts grain being threshed by a flail with the Latin saying Tribule Shio Didat, which translates to affliction in riches. The reverse has various leaf imprints which weren't just a design element. They were an anti-counterfeiting tactic invented by Benjamin Franklin who was an early supporter of paper currency. This continental note was printed by Holland Sellers of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania which Benjamin Franklin was the original owner of that printing company, but he sold out to David Hall in 1766. Certainly and rightfully, the framers of the U.S. Constitution were very leery of paper currency because of the failure of the continental dollar. The Constitution prohibits states from issuing currency, but it didn't prohibit states from chartering banks to do so. State chartered banks began springing up across the country in the early 1800s, each issuing their own banknotes. In theory, these notes were redeemable at the issuing bank for their equivalent gold or silver value. However, the reliability of banks varied greatly. The further away the notes were from the issuing bank, the less value they carried. And if the bank went under, so did your banknote. Many banks went out of business as a result of three major panics in the first half of the 1800s, which greatly diminished people's trust in paper currency. Panic was the term used then, but today we'd call it a recession. A typical example of one of the casualties of the Panic of 1857 was the Dayton Bank in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
According to a history and catalog of Minnesota obsolete banknotes and script, Lyman C. Dayton moved to St. Paul from Rhode Island in 1849. Dayton was able to acquire 5,000 plus acres of land on the east side of St. Paul, which is still known today as Dayton's Bluff. This area became the future home of the first 3M headquarters and Ham's Brewery. Dayton became a well-known real estate dealer, railroad executive, and banker. In 1856, he attempted to issue his own currency and contracted Danforth Wright & Company of New York and Philadelphia to produce one, two, and five dollar bills. Here is an uncut sheet, and as you can see, the vignettes are different, but Dayton placed his own portrait on all the denominations, which is on the narcissistic side, but I'm not going to throw any stones here being the one making YouTube videos. Few, if any, of these notes saw actual circulation. Most of the collectible banknotes today are remainders or notes that were never issued. By 1859, banknote reporters listed the notes as worthless. For the Minnesotans watching, there is no relationship between Lyman Dayton and the well-known Dayton family department stores, who also started the retail giant that everyone knows today as Target. As I said, the $1 obsolete note features a portrait of Lyman Dayton front and center, flanked by vignettes of mothers with children. Europeans on the right, and Native Americans on the left. To the far left are two Native American men, presumably they should be Dakota or Ojibwe at the time in Minnesota, but I'm positive they're not properly represented. And the far right corner has a small vignette of a farmer driving cattle along a road. Notice the telegraph. Most likely that's representing technology for the time. And I've got to go back to Lyman Dayton's portrait and take a closer look at that hair. Let me adjust the contrast just a little bit, and there we are. He must have been quite the dandy for his time to sport that hairdo. Maybe I'm just jealous of Dayton's hair because, you know. Anyway, panics and wildcat banks didn't slow down the business of issuing paper money. According to a 2015 Coin World article, at the height of production, more than 3,000 private banks in 34 states produced 30,000 plus varieties of paper banknotes during the mid-1800s. It wasn't just state chartered and private banks issuing paper notes that functioned as circulating currency. Prior to 1866, there were thousands more, including states, counties, local municipalities, local merchants, and even schools that issued paper currency. All of these currencies fall into the category of obsolete banknotes or script. Well, things were getting out of control, so in 1863, congressional legislation was led by Ohio Senator John Sherman to clean up the nation's chaotic monetary situation, proposing much more rigorous regulation of banks. Interesting side note, Senator Sherman had three brothers, Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman, Charles Sherman, a federal judge in Ohio, and Hoyt Sherman, a banker in Iowa. Talk about your family of overachievers. I mean, where's the Sherman brother that was a doctor? They didn't have the medical field covered. The losers. The first step to end obsolete banknotes was the National Currency Act of 1863, which created a currency for banks that would be federally chartered and regulated, resulting in the creation of national banknotes. In other words, the national banknotes provided federally backed competition to privately issued banknotes. The final nail in the coffin for the end of obsolete banknotes came with the Internal Revenue Act of 1865 that imposed a 10% tax on any banknotes not issued by the federal government. There was no longer enough profit for any financial institution to issue paper money. Except for the U.S. government. And that's a whole different story. Interestingly enough, neither piece of legislation made non-federal currency illegal. 
Most banks stopped issuing obsolete banknotes in 1866, but private companies continued to print scrip. This note from the state of Louisiana bank issued December 20th, 1866, was a showstopper for me. It has the portrait of 17th President Andrew Johnson on it. Most likely, Johnson was the last U.S. president that appeared on any obsolete banknote. He did get on a few stamps on the dollar coin only because he was president, and if you don't know, Andrew Johnson is continually ranked at the bottom of all presidential lists. What is interesting is to compare the similarities with the reverse of this 1866 obsolete and the series 1862 $5 legal tender note. It makes sense they look very similar. They were both produced by the American Banknote Company. Today it's common for people who aren't numismatists to confuse discontinued paper money with obsolete money. According to a U.S. government website, all U.S. currency issued since 1861 is valid and redeemable at its full face value. Obsolete banknotes have no face value today as any type of currency. Nonetheless, both retired U.S. currency and obsolete banknotes hold more value than their face. Obsolete banknotes are some of the most beautiful and unique paper currency issued in the United States. You know I had to favor the polar bear note vignette, which by the way is number 24 of the 100 greatest American notes. Obsoletes simply are beautiful and elegant works of art with elaborate vignettes. Most obsoletes were printed with just black ink, although as you've seen, color was used frequently, with the vast majority using an orange-red or green ink overprinting, but there are exceptions. U.S. obsolete currency includes thousands of different issues and forms from every corner of the United States. Many were hand-cut with scissors, most being issued by local banks, giving them somewhat uneven margins. Obsoletes with a reverse printing are in the minority. To reduce the cost of printing, many banks printed obsolete currency only on one side, known as Uniface. The paper was also very low in quality. You can see how the front ink soaks through. Makes me wonder if the expression paper thin didn't really come from obsolete banknotes. Obsolete banknotes were printed by private engraving companies, and there were a lot of them. The American Banknote Company being the most prominent. These companies produced a variety of products beyond banknotes, including stock certificates, bonds, stamps, pamphlets, books, whatever they could press ink to paper. Engraving companies is yet another aspect of the ocean of collecting obsolete banknotes and could be a whole entire video by itself. Speaking of videos by themselves, I could dedicate an entire YouTube channel to pre-Civil War paper currency alone, and that would include a lot of myths and legends. One obsolete banknote legend has it that a certain $10 note from New Orleans gave the South the name Dixieland. I'm sure many of you are aware of this legend, but you know I'm going to question it. It is true that Louisiana bag notes from several prominent financial institutions circulated far and wide during the antebellum period because they held their value, a rarity amongst obsolete banknotes. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's website, Louisiana's banking laws were sound and the state's banknotes were respected, particularly the Citizens Bank of Louisiana, first chartered in 1833 in New Orleans and became the second largest financial institution just behind the Second Bank of the United States, which handled all fiscal transactions for the U.S. government. The Bank of the United States also issued its own obsolete currency. The specific obsolete banknote said to derive the name Dixieland was the $10 denomination from the Citizens Bank of Louisiana. The note has a striking red that fades to orange overprint. The front depicts the USS Adriatic, a sidewheel steamer, and the largest ship in the world when she launched in 1856. The left portrait is of Louisiana Governor Andre Roman, who served from 1831 to 1835 and 1839 to 1843, and who, ironically, was against Louisiana seceding from the Union in 1861. The reverse side is the heart of the Dixieland banknote legend. Printed dead center is D-I-X, which is the French spelling for 10, and pronounced Dix. The reverse also has both French and English, not to be confused with a Canadian $10 note. So, Louisiana was bilingual way before Canada. How about that, Quebec? Or should I say, Quebec? 
Most likely the beauty, the legend, and the fact that it probably kept its feet on the ground but kept reaching for the stars for this note to climb its way to number 86 to America's top 100 greatest American currency notes. And if you get that reference, you probably also know what AM radio is. So the legend goes that traders from upriver, and I'm going to assume that they did have a paddle, would bring their goods down the Mississippi River to New Orleans and return home with Dixies, vernacular for Dees, as not a lot of people knew how to pronounce ten in French north of Louisiana. The name took hold and all the land south of the Ohio River became referred to as Dixie or Dixieland. The Citizens Bank of Louisiana does get credit for Dixie, but it wasn't the only $10 note from Louisiana that printed Dees on their notes. It wasn't even the only Citizens Bank of Louisiana $10 note that was issued. Here's a different $10 note that was issued by the Citizens Bank dated 1859. But is the $10 Dees obsolete banknote really the basis of the name Dixieland? I have my doubts, at least on a national scale. The key clue for me is the vignette of the USS Adriatic. This note wasn't issued until at least 1856 because that's when the year the Adriatic was launched. How could the saying Dixie spread so quickly across half a continent when it took months for a letter to be received? The origins of the name Dixieland are debated, but the name certainly was popularized by the song Dixie's Land, later changed to Dixieland, and Just Dixie, composed in 1859 by Daniel Emmett. The tune became a popular marching song of the Confederate Army and is often considered the Confederate Anthem. There are several other legends that provide origins for Dixieland and most likely all of them combined into providing Dixie the region's name. Here's an ironic moment for you. Abraham Lincoln first heard the song Dixie in early 1860 when he attended the Rumsey and Newcomb minstrel shows in Chicago. He loved the song so much that he had it played on his campaign trail in his bid for presidency in 1860. In my humble opinion, a stronger candidate for Dixieland's name, and one that provides a longer length of time, is the Mason-Dixon line that would divide free and slave states, but it was originally the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania. The term Mason and Dixon line was first used in Congress leading to the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The name comes from a 233-mile property border surveyed between 1763 and 1767 by two Englishmen, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. Their job was to define a disputed boundary between the Penns, proprietors of Pennsylvania, and the Calverts, proprietors of Maryland. There are other legends, although all are a bit weak. One being that Dixie was a children's game played in the 19th century in New York City. There is some merit to that. The game was referred to in the December 28, 1844 issue of New York's The New World, and then there's the fragile tale of a benevolent slave owner, Johann Dixie of Manhattan Island. When New York outlawed slavery in 1827, Johann Dixie sold his slaves, many of whom ended up on southern plantations. When they arrived, they spread tales of the better treatment received while living in the north, expressing their desire to return to Dixie's land. None of these have ever been confirmed and all remain myth. Maybe it's just that all of these myths and legends combined give the name Dixieland to the region. There are plenty of other obsolete banknote stories that intertwine with the history of the United States. They have certainly piqued my interest and curiosity, but they are a massive subject. The combination of the history, artwork, and frankly the strange familiarity has really captured my attention. I'm going to keep crawling deeper into the obsolete weeds with my next video, so stay tuned. I certainly appreciate your time, and if you like what you see, please hit the thumbs up button and feel free to leave me a comment. We'll see you in two weeks, and thanks for checking in.